The SAS is the Special Forces Regiment upon which all others are based. Few are tough enough to pass selection. But what does it take to survive once you make it into the Special Air Service? In this first episode of SAS Survival Secrets, we reveal how a team goes behind enemy lines to set up a covert OP or observation post. What tactics and awesome firepower do the SAS put into practice when they come face to face with the enemy? In wartime, the primary role of the Special Air Service, or SAS, is intelligence gathering. Small specialist teams go behind enemy lines secretly to gather information for future offensive operations. Eddie and his patrol will help us recreate tactical and operational procedures used by the regiment when surviving in enemy territory. The battle scenario you're about to see is fictitious, but the techniques and specialist skills shown are real and based on SAS procedure. There's been a military coup in a rogue state. A general in the army has taken power and is using his stronghold to launch attacks on neighboring countries and sponsor terrorism. The SAS have been called in. Eddie will command a four-man team that will go behind enemy lines to gather information on numbers of combatants, weapons, command structures, and assess plans for future attacks. Our team have over 30 years of combined experience in the SAS. It's the combination of rigorous selection, hyper-intensive training, and specialization in skills that makes the Special Forces special. In an SAS patrol, we normally have four basic skills. Johnny. Johnny is a lead scout in this operation. He is also a linguist, speaks Serb, Croatian, and French. John Mack. He's a radio operator. He's also a demolitions expert. Pete. He's a patrol medic. He's also a trained sniper. Myself, I'm the patrol commander. I'm a sniper specialist and a trained demolitionist. All of these skills, plus the firepower we have, makes us a formidable force. At the start of any mission, there's a briefing. So the first thing Eddie does is convene a Chinese parliament. During the planning of operations, the SAS pride themselves on listening to the views of all ranks. Remember, the most junior of ranks in the SAS are actually senior soldiers recruited from other regiments, so everyone has lots of soldiering experience. We're going to insert into Zangara, yeah? Which we've been expecting for a while anyway. We're going to insert by boat on this beach here. Johnny, what I need you to do, mate, is find out the tides, etc., for the beach, mate, yeah? The tide run here is actually quite steep. It's about 24 to 27 feet, so it's give us another sort of tight window hole to actually insert. Going into an OP, but it's an offensive OP. We may be required to take a target out once we get in there, lads, yeah? The SAS are experts in setting up observation posts and remaining in them for long periods of time. Most of the tactical operations in a mission of this sort take place under the cover of night but for the purpose of these reconstructions, they'll be taking place in daylight. We've got three days from landing to get in, establish the OP, and be ready to start reporting back. As the maximum duration, Eddie? 28 days, lads, right? So we've got a lot of gear to take with us, right? So we've got to get that sorted out. You can get the medical kit sorted out. Johnny, Mike, right? You get the rations, start clicking all the gear, ammunition. All the rest of it. Well, you should not. I'll have a good map study. When a four man team go on operations, they never know what they'll encounter behind enemy lines. But elite forces have to be prepared for the unexpected. What they take is crucial to their survival and combat readiness. If you're going in an OP behind enemy lines for 28 days, you've got to be very selective as to what kit you take with you. This kit you see in front of you is an example of what one man the patrol would carry. Weapons, with a sniper rifle down there, M16 and a 9mm Browning. 
The M16 is the standard issue American assault rifle, but the SAS was quick to adopt it for operations as it is both lightweight, rugged, and has a high rate of fire. It can also be combined with the M203 grenade launcher. The SAS always carry pistols for personal protection. The Browning High Power and the Sig Sauer P226 are both 9mm semi-automatic weapons with considerable stopping power. The long-range L96A1 sniper rifle is a standard of the British Army. Eddie, a sniper specialist, can hit a target over a thousand meters away, and his expertise may be called into action during the OP. The Bergen, this is where all this kit's got to go into. The rations, we've got 28 days rations here. Obviously, that's not gonna fit into the Bergen. Each man, it's up to him what he keeps and what he takes, because don't forget, he's going to be carrying the stuff at the end of the day. You've got a rice pudding, keep that. You've got beef burger and beans and steak and potatoes. Throw one, keep the other one. Drinking chocolate mix. Because we're on hard routine, we won't be heating anything or cooking anything. But this can be mixed with cold water and drunk, nutritious. It is vital that Eddie and his team leave no trace of their activity at the OP. Whatever they take in, they must leave with. This includes their own body waste, which must be bagged and taken away in their Bergens. The smell of cooking could alert the enemy, so they must live on cold rations. They must do all this whilst remaining tactically alert. This discipline is known as hard routine. If you had to survive for a month in a hole in the ground, what rations would you place on the menu? Vegetable stock drink. Bennett. Whitener for your tea and coffee. Once again, you might be thinking, bin that, but you don't, you keep that. When I was in the Falklands, 28 days behind enemy lines, for the last seven days, we lived in powdered milk and sugar mixed in water, because there were no rations left. Keep it. Matches. We're not lighting anything. Bin them. Spare clothing. Spare batteries for your torches. Camouflage cream. Bungee cords. They're very handy for strapping stuff onto the back of your Bergen. Batteries for the radio. Every member of the patrol has to carry the radio batteries. We've got a night sight for the sniper rifle. Claymore mine. Claymores were first used by the SAS in Borneo. They fire around 350 metal balls to a range of 100 meters, making them an awesome defensive weapon in the SAS arsenal. Ammunition. Each man will carry five magazines plus up to three or 400 spare rounds in case we get involved in a firefight. All of this needs to be put into your Bergen and taken on this 28-day OP. This will weigh approximately 120 to 130 pounds. Imagine carrying three five-year-old children on your back, then you'll get an idea of how heavy a Bergen can be. But to survive in the SAS, it's the most basic of requirements and part of selection to be able to march long distances with this amount of weight. Everything is meticulously planned before an SAS mission. Phase one, the insertion. We're going to get landed towards last light on the beach. We'll then set off, move into all-round defence. The orders issued by the patrol commander will break down in detail the mission's objectives and contingency plans. The mission will be in four stages. The team will get to the drop zone by boat and then covertly travel some 30 kilometres east, where they'll rendezvous with an undercover agent who will provide them with vital information. They'll then go deeper behind enemy lines to set up the OP. After the operation, the team will travel northeast, where they will be extracted by helicopter. A Special Forces boat team have dropped the patrol on a beach some 50 kilometers from the target. The patrol have to move to the OP on foot. The SAS call this tabbing. Tabbing is an essential insertion technique when setting up OPs. 
Since your primary role is to gather intelligence, you can't just crash in on the enemy's doorstep. So SAS patrols normally get dropped some distance from the target in order to maximize secrecy on their clandestine approach. Insertion via sea to land is a critical period on a covert operation. We've now progressed further off the beach. We have adapted all around defense. This gives us a 360 degree observation and arc of fire. This is used in all aspects of warfare. The point man, Johnny, is in the most advanced position. It's his job to look and listen. Just tactically sit quiet till the boats disappear and we get tuned into the local atmosphere. If something happens now, I'm in a good defendable position. I've got cover to my front. I'm happy with Eddie's signal. I know where he is in my right. I can see the road left to right. I can see that main gate. So I've got a good arc of fire. I am 60% of the firepower of the gun. Johnny's weapon is a mini-me, which has far greater firepower than the M16. It has a 200-round box magazine, which provides a rate of fire of 850 rounds per minute. With an effective range of around 600 meters, it has proved its worth to the SAS in many contact situations. Eddie gives a signal to say it's safe to move on, but only once the team are sure the surroundings are free of enemy. At various points along their route, the patrol will choose an emergency rendezvous. A signal is passed along the patrol that lets everyone know its exact location. The ERV is the position to which all members of the patrol will return to if they have to retreat quickly from an enemy attack. The first man, or point, must remain hyper alert to any enemy activity. The point man is constantly picking the route. He's looking for the best route and most tactical route up to the objective. He's now selected the route and he's going to move off down that route. You'll notice as he's patrolling, he's very careful when he's transferring his weight onto his forward foot. This is in case there's any booby traps. The last man is responsible for protecting the patrol's rear. He's called Tail End Charlie. Enemy rear! But any contact with the enemy like this means compromise. Instead, go back to basics with the five S's of camouflage. Helmets, rifle and kit have a definite clear square shape so you'll need to break up straight lines. Use strips of scrim and cloth, or the addition of local vegetation. A man's body in sunlight and moonlight casts a shadow. SAS patrols never use paths or established tracks to avoid their shadows being cast on the open ground. One of the main giveaways on camouflage is shine. Anybody wearing wristwatches, chains, give your position away in no time at all. Silhouettes are also a dead giveaway. There's no point in being well camouflaged if you walk along the top of a hill creating a moving outline that's easy to spot. SAS patrols tap below the ridge line, blending in with the vegetation. They also maintain space between each other. This spacing makes the patrol less easy to spot whilst on the move. If you perfect the five S's, shape, shine, shadow, silhouette and spacing, this is what you can achieve. Operating behind enemy lines means moving quietly and undetected. SAS teams have a system of hand signals to communicate with each other silently. Halt. Down in the ground. Obstacle. Friendly. Enemy. Recce. Listen in. 
move forward. ERV, emergency rendezvous point. Mine or booby trap. Water. Building. Ambush left. Ambush right. The patrol are entering the second phase of their mission. They've tapped for 30 kilometers into semi-populated rural areas. Being so close to farmland means that the slightest noise could give them away to the enemy. Hand signals become their only means of communication. We're coming along the track. Lead scout, John. Heard some noise. Stop the patrol. Signal the enemy in front. I then give the hand signal for an immediate ambush right. We're now waiting an ambush to decide whether we take out this enemy patrol or we let them pass to continue with the mission. We're in a position to take the enemy out if we're discovered, but the mission is more important. Our mission supersedes taking out three normal squaddies walking along back to the base camp. The next phase of their mission is the highly risky agent contact. Yet it should provide valuable new intelligence for the OP and their target, the renegade general. The meeting is scheduled to take place at a farmhouse, yet being so close to civilians puts a lot of pressure on the point man, Johnny. His main concern is the noise that we're gonna make when we're moving, because any noise we make can be heard. Also, if we make a noise, then we can't hear any other noise which is around us. Now that the patrol have the rendezvous point for the agent contact in sight, they sit tight. They've got to be sure of their man, so they await a signal. Civilians, their enemy as well, until we know exactly who they are. So we can't compromise the mission by unexpectedly bumping into farmers, farm laborers around the buildings. Agent has given the pre-arranged signal, so Eddie briefs the patrol on the next plan of action. Start getting changed. Camouflage uniforms in built-up areas would attract attention, so Eddie and Mac change into civvies to meet the agent. When doing an agent contact, you don't know what's going to happen. The agent could have turned, he could have been followed by enemy patrols, he could have been under observation. You don't know what's going to happen when you arrive there. The SAS use codes to verify the authenticity of agents. Mac will say a number, and the agent has to respond with another number that adds up to nine. Hello? Seven? Two. If the agent doesn't get his sums right, then Mac and Eddie will treat him as hostile. You'll notice our hands are on weapons at all times. You'll be observing around you at all times, checking the buildings, checking the surrounding area. This is critical for your own safety. We will definitely be at headquarters within the next seven days, that's all I know. He always arrives in a large green 4x4, and sometimes he comes to inspect the troops at night, sometimes during the day. Patrol now tap a further 20 kilometers southeast to the enemy base for phase three of the mission. Upon finding a good OP position, they must first construct a lying up point, or LUP. 
Situated just to the rear of the OP, this mini base provides support for the men in the forward position. The patrol will split into pairs. One team will rest and eat in the lying up position, whilst the other observes the target from the OP. The teams rotate in shifts. The LUP is constructed with defense in mind, with several bug out routes should the patrol be compromised and they need to get away quickly. It's designed so that each patrol member has a camouflaged scrape in which to lie up. First, the surface layer of turf is sliced away and kept to be used as camouflage material. All the spoil from the LUP construction has to be put in sandbags and painstakingly hidden so as to conceal any signs of activity. Each hole in the LUP is lined with grass to help keep it dry. The positions are further concealed with a roof of chicken wire stuffed with grass and surrounding vegetation. Once the LUP is complete, it will offer concealment day or night for patrol members. Over the next few nights, the patrol will construct the observation post. The OP is built on similar lines to the LUP, but it's more like a trench, being deeper by around four and a half feet. The two snipers in the team, Eddie and Pete, take it in turns to occupy the OP. Mac and Johnny act as their spotters. Now the OP is set, the team have to observe a hard routine. They must gather as much intelligence as possible and stay alert to the possible arrival of the general. Four before. Two up, two up. Yeah, got them. Yeah. For the sake of our fictional war story, and in order to nip a conflict in the bud and save thousands of lives, headquarters have ordered Eddie's patrol to use any opportunity to take out the enemy general. Now all that's left is for the team to wait. Living in cramped conditions, eating the same rations and whispering all the time whilst remaining alert requires a tremendous amount of discipline. It's vital to have this kind of self-discipline if you hope to survive in the SAS. Occupying an OP position, especially from a spotter or a sniper's point of view, is a very long and arduous task. You've constantly got to be alert, watching what's happening down in the enemy position. You'll notice behind us there's no silhouette. We've camouflaged it. So we're very low to the ground, and the outline's broken up with the foliage behind us. Psst, Eddie, Eddie, vehicle coming. OK, it's a green 4x4, four four. two up. We've got something in the back. Barrels, they've got barrels in the back. Intelligence gathering, enemy positions, where are they located? How many enemies there? What is their morale like? Are they disciplined? Are they less disciplined at certain periods of time? In other words, when the officer clears off, does their discipline drop? What are they like at night? The patrolling tactics, how do they patrol? All of this information is vital. Even though you may think it is the smallest thing, it can mean the matter of life or death for a soldier. This information must get sent back to the headquarters by radio. They can then work out a plan to take out that enemy position. Two guys come out of the building. And they're unloading the barrels. Steady. Excellent. She stopped. Okay, she's getting out. It's a she, she's getting out. Opening the boot. They're having a look. Okay, they're happy. Boot's closed. She's pulling off. Heading towards the building. She's pulling up on black. Mac and Eddie use a standard practice of colour coding different areas of the target to avoid confusion. Okay, she's stopped. She's out, she's opened the boot. Two guys coming out the building. 
Taking some stuff at the boot. Not sure what it is. Guard's still back in their position. Steady. Green, four before. Driver, somebody in the back. Go on. Oops. We've got an activity at the guard, mate. The guard's moving up. Yeah. This could be your man, mate. They've been waved through by the guards heading towards the house. OK, he's pulling up, he's stopping. Driver's getting out, opening the door. It's your man, it's X-ray. At this moment now, you're about to take the most important shot of your life. You could be in that OP for three weeks, four weeks. You're cold, you're stiff, but you've got to keep yourself alert. Keep the circulation going when you're in that position. Being a sniper might sound or feel like a very clinical way of taking someone out. It is, but it is also a very, very important tactic. This person who you're going to kill could be very, very important to future troop movements. Your mind is clear, the person stops, you take the first pressure on the trigger. At this point, you wait. The enemy might not know where you've shot from. If they don't, then there'll be total confusion. If they do locate where you've shot from, you're obviously going to return fire. Try and take as many of them out as you can. During this phase, the other two members of your patrol will be getting their gear together, ready to give you assistance, because they know we've got to move fast. Contact with the enemy means compromise. It's time to abandon the OP. Eddie disables the sniper rifle by throwing away the bolt, and the patrol make a break for it. The team are now on the run, and although they initially break contact with the enemy HQ, the countryside will soon be crawling with hostile troops. Things are about to go from bad to worse for Eddie's patrol. They are 50 kilometers from their own lines, and now face the virtual certainty of continuing sustained enemy contact. Contact drills. These were developed by the SAS over many years and in many theatres and is an integral part of the training of any SAS soldier. It allows us to fan out into formation and put down maximum firepower to allow you to pull out of a situation which you feel is too hot for you to handle. At this stage here, my lead scout will spot the enemy patrol. He will immediately put fire down. The rest of the patrol will move into fire positions. When we've got the enemy's heads down, we will then start pulling back as two teams. You will notice that at no time does anyone move backwards unless there's fire coming down from the other two guys. Whenever we break contact with the enemy, in other words, when we've lost sight of them, the patrol commander will then give the word break. <laughs> we'll break off the contact and move off on the patrol in a different direction. With a contact right or a contact left, the procedure is exactly the same. Contact left! For a contact left, we do not have to fan out. We're already in that line. So we immediately turn to the area of threat put down maximum firepower. When we've got the enemy's heads down again, we'll then start pulling back in our buddy-buddy system and break off the contact. Contact rear. This is when the tail end Charlie spots the enemy behind us. He will immediately shout contact rear we will once again fan out exactly the same as we did for the contact front, lay down maximum fire and pull back as we did in the previous contact. At the beginning of the mission, the team were carrying hefty Bergen backpacks with every conceivable bit of kit for any eventuality. But these were abandoned at the LUP and OP positions when they went on the run. 
All they have now is their operational waistcoats and their webbing belts. So how do they hope to survive off their belt kits when they still have a journey back to safety of over 40 kilometers through hostile territory? When surviving behind enemy lines, you'll carry approximately 350 rounds of spare ammunition. You'll have grenades for the 203s, white phosphorus grenades, fragmentation grenades. You'll have five magazines, which is on your belt kit, GPS, a normal compass, and a whistle. Your weapon, your tack bay, which is a tactical beacon, ground to air. Right angle torch, which also has a small button compass at the bottom. A waterproof bivy bag, a couple of spare rations. This one is beef burger and beans, my favorite. Lovely juggler. An infrared strobe, a day-night flare, a couple of water bottles and a metal mug, a decent knife, a various tourniquets, a decent pair of scissors, a couple of sets of forceps, blister treatment equipment, sutures, two different types. You have to stitch yourself up, a broad-based antibiotic, a little saw, collapsible. Some small pieces of rubber, burns for a long time, you can get your fire going. I carry this bottle, which has got a purification system inside it. This is good for about 150 litres of water. Magnesium block with a striker. Tampon. Break this open, get a little piece off, use your flint, strike it, and you get a nice little fire from it. Various survival bags. A small knife, a wire saw, a heliograph, a spare button compass, fishing hooks, wire for making traps, a multi-tool, a head torch. I carry neoprene gloves. Even if they get wet, they still keep your hands warm. Your basic belt kit, followed by your operational waistcoat. Into this and this goes all this equipment. Although they've shaken off the enemy, a number of hostile contacts have left ammunition in short supply. Yet as long as they can maintain a decent pace, they should make their helicopter rendezvous. <laughs> Mac has fallen victim to one of the world's most indiscriminate weapons. They are sleeping soldiers that will kill and maim anything from civilians to animals. Landmines. Anti-personnel mines come in all shapes and sizes. Some are as small as a woman's powder compact, others the size of a house brick. All are packed with the material to create lethal shrapnel that maims and kills. Unlike soldiers, they stay on duty long after the fighting has stopped. Mac may have been blown up in our enactment, but in real life, he is John McAleese, holder of the military medal and an expert in explosives. OK, what we've got here, it's a American pineapple anti-personnel mine. Touching any one of these three little prongs, where from the top or from the side, it will trigger the mine to go off. Designed to maim, not to kill. When the mine explodes, it's basically a hot piece of the metal flying everywhere, and this causes trauma to the lower limbs. here is a Yugoslavian mine, which is used quite a lot in Kosovo. Normally operated by a tripwire, which we see here. Very difficult to see. I'll mark it so you can get an idea of what it's like. Normally troops will come along. It's normally between ankle and knee height. Trip this wire. It only takes five pounds to eight pounds of pressure to release the trigger on the mine, and it will detonate and fragmentate in a 360 degree arc. Right, what we've got in front of us here is an anti-tank mine. If we just peel back the earth, we can see what we've got below us. Plastic coated mine. OK, what we've got on top of this mine is a sort of disarming switch. Basically, it's twirled round onto the plunger, which prevents the plunger from going in and igniting the mine. The mine's placed in the ground, safety pins pulled out, the thing is armed. Along comes the vehicle, tank, APC, anything like that at all, goes over the top, boom, goodbye the boys. What we've got here 
It's a Valmira 69, produced in Italy, and they've been banned by the Geneva Convention now, but there's still millions of them all around the world. When this is triggered, what happens is the mine actually erupts out the ground to about two metres and sends out metal in a 360-degree arc, killing, decapitating, maiming. Very naughty weapon. There are still millions of these. That's why we're getting children and animals blown up all around the world, causing maximum damage and destruction. A disgrace. In our mission story, Mac stood on a blast mine, about the size of a small tin of salmon. Its nickname is a toe popper, which doesn't belie the fact that it has shredded Mac's leg. So how will Eddie's team extricate themselves from the center of a minefield with a major casualty? The only way out is the way they came in. They must retrace their steps exactly. Every inch of ground has to be precisely checked for any mines or tripwires that were narrowly missed. Getting to the injured man and extracting him is a major challenge, and any false move will create another casualty. The wounded man must be carried out. Mines are often designed to maim rather than kill. A dead man is no longer a drain upon resources, whereas a wounded man ties up huge amounts of personnel. Not only does he have to be extracted from the battlefield, he will need vast amounts of medical treatment for the short, medium and long-term future. The team now have to find a safe place where patrol medic Pete can treat the mine blast victim whilst Eddie and Johnny take up defensive positions in case of attack. The enemy are highly likely to have heard the explosion. The impact of the blast has ripped right through Mac's leg. A patrol medic customizes his kit depending on the nature and size of any mission. In this case, the kit needs to be light, but sophisticated enough to deal with the horrific injuries associated with combat. With the casualty still breathing, the priority is to stem the flow of blood from the leg using a variety of sterile dressings. Excessive blood loss could lead to death. The medic also needs to stop any chance of infection by dirt and debris from the mine blast. During the treatment, the casualty will be conscious but in a state of shock. Field dressings are standard military issue throughout the British Armed Forces. Compact in design, they are carried by all personnel as part of their basic kit. The next priority in a trauma situation like this is to secure circulation. The medic needs to get an intravenous drip into a vein before it collapses. This is also critical to ensure a good drug route into the body. Throughout the treatment, the medic must always be ready to grab his M16 and take up a defensive position should the patrol come under attack. Needles carried by combat medics are designed to gain immediate entry into a vein. They are twice the size of those carried by ordinary paramedics. Pete sets up an intravenous fluid on a small drip using the weight of the patient to create a steady flow. The final step involves using a key code to mark the casualty's forehead to help the evacuation unit. In Mac's case, it's an M to show he's been given morphine. Serious injury to a member of the SAS patrol has severely affected their mobility to break away from behind enemy lines. The mine explosion has alerted the local militia, and the SAS are about to be contacted or bumped yet again. The medic has to leave his patient and engage in the firefight.
Johnny! Pete, go and check Johnny. The ferocious firefight has left all the enemy dead, but the SAS patrol has also taken losses. Ted, get his weapons and ammo. Okay. Even with a patrolman dead, there is no time for sentiment. Pete strips Johnny's body for the remains of his weapons and ammunition. The, the patrol chooses to replace Pete's M16 with the firepower of the Mini-Me. With the patrol now down to three and one still critical, the chances of making it to a successful extraction point are fading fast. The immediate priority is to lift and shift to a suitable place for shelter before darkness falls. Worst-case scenario for a combat medic in times of conflict is when they have to contend with not one, but multiple casualties. Recently, armed forces traveling in convoys have come under attack in places like Kosovo and the Gulf with horrific consequences. British combat medics, faced with mass casualties during the Falklands War, worked with a system called triage when deciding who was first priority for treatment. Many medics were under the command of Surgeon Rick Jolly, Casualties have come in in large numbers in three separate incidents. And uh, I won't give you any figures, but I'm proud to say that thanks to the combined efforts of the naval surgeons and the army surgeons and the Royal Marines that support them, everyone that's come in here alive, despite their horrible wounds, has gone out alive. 21 years on from the Falklands conflict, we've asked Surgeon Rick Jolly to explain the actions of an SAS patrol medic when faced with a multiple casualty scenario. We have simulated an incident in which a vehicle patrol is hit by a rocket-propelled grenade. This is a nightmare scenario for an SAS medic who needs to treat the casualties and keep them alive during what is medically known as the golden hour of survival. Here we've got an individual. He hasn't got time for emotion. He has to apply the principles of triage or sorting very bravely. Divide the casualties into priorities for treatment. On his first assessment, the medic has to make a series of instant decisions in diagnosing who to treat first. This is based on the history of the incident and the casualty's ability to breathe, not on who calls out the loudest in pain. I see the love. In medical terms, this is called ABC, maintaining airways, breathing, and circulation. The first diagnosis is the most crucial. Any mistakes or indecision at this stage could mean death for one or more of the casualties. In his first uh, quick uh, walk around and assessment, he has put an airway into the driver's uh, mouth to keep the tongue forward. Now, the first thing he's got to do is, in suspecting that there might be a chest injury, is to expose the access area. And uh, he goes to his magic bag. Now, I want you to notice how the uh, material from the bag is organized in his mind, and he goes straight to it. He's got a syringe, a needle, a cannula uh, in his hands, and paramedics in the military, especially those who work with special forces, are taught uh, to access the circulation via the jugular vein. This casualty will still have further breathing problems, but with three more casualties to treat, he needs to move on. This chap in the back of the vehicle, who, from his appearance, has obviously sustained thermal burns, flash burns to the face, to the inside of the nose, the inside of the mouth, and down to the soft tissues of the throat. The tissues of the voice box are very, very sensitive to this kind of heat and can swell up with enormous rapidity. And so he's going to do something about it. And he puts an intravenous infusion up. And the first thing he does, once that is flowing and running and he's got the line stabilized, is he then draws up um, a dose of steroids to try and reduce the amount of swelling that will result 
from flash burns of the throat. Um, he's done what's necessary for this patient, and he can put up a little flip card in the back of his mind. I may still have some problems with the airway on this one. Oh, what about me? Oh. This chap's going to need help, but he can wait. And he comes down to the prone casualty who's lying there in a pretty well near unconscious state. He sees the warning sign of blood in the ear. He might very well have uh, suffered a, a serious spinal injury. So very correctly and uh, very swiftly, he gets out the um, cervical collar and he quickly locks it into an estimated correct position in relation to the body. Then our poor chap left. Here he really is um, the lowest item on the totem pole. The SAS medic has completed his first round of treatment on all four casualties. Casualty one has been given an intravenous access for drugs and blood. Casualty two has been given an intravenous drip to reduce the amount of swelling in his throat. Casualty three has received a neck brace. Casualty four has been given no treatment so far. We'll find out later in the program how our medic increases the casualty's chances of survival. But for now, it's back to our mission. The patrol has, over the course of the day, endured a firefight which has left one of the team dead. Another remains critically injured, and they are still miles away from a safe extraction point. To make matters worse, the enemy have replaced the ineffective local militia with an elite hunter force. Their commander, wary of booby traps, first sends in a man to check the dead SAS patrolman's body. He then begins a detailed sweep of the area, searching for the remains of blood, bullets and boot marks to track the SAS patrol. Leave them. The actions of the SAS patrol have until now been based on adrenaline. This has been the first time they have managed to lie up in relative safety and think about what they need to do next. Eddie, the patrol commander, knows that the chances of making it to safety from behind enemy lines are fading fast, especially with an injured man to carry. Also, the chances of Max surviving all the way to the extraction point are slim. The patrol needs to make a difficult survival decision. Should they leave their man behind, or should they continue to carry him? medical treatment we have given him, although it's good, is very basic. He's slowing us down considerably, but that's not a reason for leaving him. It's Mac who makes the decision to stay behind, giving the patrol a better chance of making it to safety. Go. Are you sure, man? Sure. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, Paul, well, you leave my side arm, yeah? It's good. John. Go, man. It's good. Do you want me to go, go well, on. buddy? Go. See you in hell. Leaving Mac behind gives Eddie and Pete a realistic chance of covering enough ground overnight to make it to their prearranged extraction point. Realistically, you know and he knows that there's no way you're going to escape carrying him along with you. You have to listen to what he says and then coldly and clinically make a decision. Patrol comes first. Johnny Mark will get better treatment if he's captured, hopefully, than he will ever get with us. Staying with us, you'll probably end up dead. We return to the scene of our Land Rover multiple casualty scenario, in which an SAS medic is halfway through dealing with the injured. 
He's entered the final part of the golden hour of survival and now has to reassess the priorities for treatment. Back to the driver, whose pattern of breathing has changed. The lung has collapsed, air is going in to the chest wall. He's got to get a device and a drain valve through the chest wall to drain it. And he quickly assembles the components. It's a drainage tube and an intercostal drain itself. He gets out the scalpel, incises the skin, and he makes the hole wider using the steel pair of forceps. He takes the cannula and passes it along the line of his finger and then pushes until it enters the chest. And he knows that he has struck gold when there is a loud <laughs> As the air rushes out and he's performed a life-saving procedure. So having left the driver, Pete comes around to the back of the Land Rover again, assesses the patient and realizes that there is respiratory obstruction probably because the vocal cords have swollen up so much and have obstructed the airway. He has to go beneath the obstruction, below the vocal cords. And to do that, he is carrying a mini tracheostomy set. He then secures this device with um, a piece of uh, tape, which he ties into place. And then, because the patient is suffering quite a lot of discomfort and pain, gets out an ampoule of a proprietary pain relief, draws it up in a syringe, and then without a needle, he inserts the drug straight into the circulation. He needs to establish an airway. He goes to his kit and gets out a nasal tube. So you'll have a range of sizes. Quite a good um, yardstick, if you like, is the size of the little finger. Again, the airway of the A of ABC is being protected. Then our poor chap with the leg. He'll get out a uh, field dressing, and this is put straight onto the fracture to suppress bleeding and to cover it to prevent uh, soiling and infection. After the, uh, the wound has been dressed and tied down, the, the rest of the bandage is used to tie the leg to the other leg in the form of external splinting. He has done the right thing at the right time, last for this individual. And when you think about it, if he came into casualty with a leg looking like that, he would be descended on. Now the concern comes for evacuation. So what we've seen here is excellent battlefield first aid on individuals who had been granted this golden hour of survival with life-threatening injuries which could so easily have killed them if they'd been ignored or just abandoned on the battlefield. Our original four-man SAS team are now down to two as their mission behind enemy lines has gone from bad to worse. One member of the team has been killed and another left behind seriously injured. Hard on their heels is an elite hunter force keen to avenge the deaths of their comrades. The tracking skills of this specialized unit have paid off with the prized scalp of injured SAS patrolman John Mack. Next time on SAS Survival Secrets, the saga continues. Find out what it takes to escape and go on the run with the SAS and learn how to survive capture and interrogation.